Uh, I'll be reading the scripture for today. Uh, it's from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, chapter 13, starting with verse 17, and then we'll go on to Exodus 14, verses 1 through 4. Exodus 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of a cloud to guide them on their way, and by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. On to Exodus 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi, Hahiroth, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh, and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Amen. So I will gain glory, the Lord says, by what happens. Thank you for coming this morning. The feast has been prepared and it's in the pew in front of you. So if you didn't bring your Bible, if it's not on your phone, reach for a pew Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 13. This is a story that needs some setup. So I've, I've decided to ask our visual arts people to help me with this. I have three pictures that I want you to, to think about. I'm not even going to turn around. I don't even see what he's got. He's got three or so pictures for each one. I want you to f focus your mind now on a parent. Okay, there we are. A parent trying to help a baby to walk. How many of you parents have done this? You know what? With you, I'm going to say what idiots we were. Helping our children run away from us. We should have just left them crawling, right? I mean, come on. But there we are holding the child, and we're so excited that they're taking their first steps with us. Not thinking that a few short years from then, they're going to say, see you, Mom. And they're going to run on their own. I want you to hold that picture in your mind. We're going to move to maybe an older situation. Now you're a child and you have a mom or dad. And now it's your turn. Now it's your turn to help them to keep on walking, 
to steady them. Maybe to help them get to the walker. The third idea that, that I want you to hold in your mind is, is a young man uh, at the door. Let's see what you got. Oh, yes. Okay. I want you to think of that time. Maybe, gentlemen, you have had this experience. I want you to think of that time that you went to the door to get your date for the prom or your date for something. Where's, oh, there it is. That's the one I was thinking of. And dad... Dad is like, bring her back at 11, or I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to be polishing this, this weapon. Because he doesn't trust you, young man. He is, he is giving you his, his daughter to go on a date with. You say, Pastor, oh my goodness, oh wow. And she's smiling, look at her, look at her, she's smiling. Fourth picture is the one that I want you to think about, and we're going to get a movie clip to help us along in just a moment. I want you to see there in Exodus chapter 13 that the signal has been given to move forward, and approximately, and uh, various scholars will uh, go back and forth on this, approximately 2 million people. My Bible says 600,000 men. That doesn't talk about the women and the children, but 600,000 men respond to moving forward. They are moving forward because God has, has said, I am here to deliver you. I am here to bring you out of Egypt. I'm here to bring you out of slavery. And so they begin to move forward. This is not a, a, an easy thing to do. They are clothed in their traveling clothes. The Bible says they have the, the, the residue of the bread that they had baked for the Passover with them. That was their main sustenance that they were taking. They were taking the leftovers of the Passover meal or, or maybe some things that they had with them, their, their flocks and their herds. And as I reread the, the plague story, I realized that those flocks and herds may have been the only flocks and herds in all of Egypt because God had sent hail that killed any, any animal and any servant that, that was foolish enough to be out in, in the, the, the outskirts of, of Egypt at that time and had not listened to their masters who, who would have been warned by Moses to bring them inside and be safe because the hail was going to devastate the land. That was just one of the plagues. But they're moving forward. They're, they're moving out in faith, in trust, in this God that, that Moses has reminded them of. And then the text comes and, and, and you hear it. And I want, I want you to think of those, those pictures. The, first the baby and, and then the grandparent or the, or the, or the parent and then the, the young man who's, who's tentatively coming to the door for, for the date. I want you to think about the fact that God, God was that young man. God was that parent. God was that helpful person with that grandparent or that parent. And he's, he's there and he's going, come on, come on, you can do it, you can do it. Two million people with their flocks and their herds and their carts and their baggage. And they're saying, where are we going? And he's saying, come on, come on, I'll show you, I'll show you, I'll protect you. Just come with me. They go out into the desert to a place called Sukkot. And still to this day, that is the place that they uh, made booths for themselves and they celebrate the feast of Sukkot. It's a fun thing to look at the feasts that uh, the Israelite people kept then and that many still keep now because they are teaching events. 
It's good to remember them, and in the future we may actually use them in the teaching in this church, simply because they are still good teaching devices. But they make booths for a few days, and then they move to another place, and then finally they move to this, this uh, special place. And, and Terry read it so well, so I'm going to get my glasses so that I can read it properly. Okay, they are at this place called Pi. Do you have that text? Do you see that, that word there? Pi ha, ha hirot. I'm going to say ha hirot. Pi ha hirot. All the while, they have had a pillar of cloud that has been leading them during the day. I want you to notice that God was in the air conditioning business. If you ever want to think about God in various ways, you can understand that he was also uh, a representative for his own brand of air conditioning and that he led them with a cloud. Now, you need shelter in the daytime in the desert because uh, the, it, it does get very hot. I know it gets very hot here, but it gets even hotter in the Arabian Peninsula. And in fact, these are some of the hottest places on earth. So he gives them cloud cover during the day, and he has a special cloud in the front, as again, I want you to hold these pictures in your mind, because here he is, he's leading them, he's leading them, come on, come on, follow me. And then at night, he has the fire, because that's what happens in the desert. There's a huge temperature swing. It can go down to freezing at night. So instead of a pillar of cloud that would not be helpful at night, it's a pillar of fire. And the Bible says that this also was light. It also gave them the opportunity to not only follow him during the daytime, but also follow him at night. So they're moving. They're, they're, they're doing what he is asking them to do, and he is leading them. I want to just go into a little parenthesis and tell you the story of going to Bethlehem. It was a, a pastor that told the story. He was on one of these trips with lots of other pastors, and he's on the bus, and he's noticing a herd of sheep, a little group of sheep, and then he's noticing a man with a stick, and he is behind the sheep, and he's going like this. He went to the driver, who was also the tour guide, and said, but I thought that shepherds went in front of their sheep and led their sheep. <laughs> the driver laughed. He said, that's not a shepherd. That's a butcher. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, David said. He is not driving them from behind. He is leading them from the front with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They're moving. They're, they're, they're confused. They, they don't know exactly where they're going. They just know that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has called them out of slavery. Finally, he has come. 430 years. Now, I don't know if some of you have asked for something from God even this week. And he didn't give it to you. And like Paula, she was very wise to ask you to remember that maybe if he didn't give it to you this week, he's going to give it to you next. Are you going to have the faith to hang on? Am I? How long has the Seventh-day Adventist church been saying, Jesus is coming soon? My granddaddy? My daddy? Me? How many of us have grown up as Adventists thinking, yep, I'm going to be one of those who just walks right into the kingdom of heaven. I'm not going to die. Jesus is coming before I die.
Nice thought. But I have ceased focusing on that. You may say, Pastor, how, how can you do this? Because Jesus says that when I have come to you, you will have life. So I'm saying today, thank you, Jesus, for the life that I have right now. How many of you have, have maybe made that move? I, I mentioned it to one of our teachers at Crescenta Valley on Monday when I went and did worship with them. And it was kind of a new thought to remember that good old Adventist teaching that what happens, let me see, test time, you ready? Quiz, quiz time in church. So I hope you're awake. What happens when you accept Jesus as your personal savior from sin and death? What happens at that very moment? Sorry? You become a new person. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you if there are any legal eagles. This is a legal moment. This is a legal transaction. We sing that song, Jesus paid it all, right? So there's, there's some transaction that's taking place at that moment. He has paid it all. There is a legal transaction that takes place when you accept his gift of eternal life. What happens? You are now transferred into the book of God. The book of life, your name. Don't we talk about the fact your name? Is your name written there? Right? We sing about it, don't we? We're asking, have you accepted? Have you said yes? And is your name written in the book of life? Are you part of the kingdom? Are, 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 you, are you headed to eternity? That's the answer I wanted. When we accept Jesus as our personal savior from sin, we go from a trajectory of death to a trajectory of eternal life. Do we not? So, having said yes, amen. Yes, pastor, this is so true. How did your week go? This was a week of your eternal life. Because you can't have it both ways, Adventist. You can't say, oh, it's going to happen someday. Oh, yes, he's going to come back someday, and I can't wait till Jesus comes. <laughs> yeah. And then not really care what happened this last week. Because you have accepted Jesus, and as your personal Savior, he has brought you into his kingdom. And that means eternal life, because don't we say, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Yeah, we say it at a funeral. Not on normal Sabbath mornings, right? But don't you know, that is the best news for humanity. You no longer have to be scared to die. Because Jesus has risen from the grave, and because he rose from the grave, you too will rise from the grave and continue your eternal life with just a little blip of time maybe being asleep. That's how I understand it. Is that how you understand it? Is that not good news? I had a friend last week whose son decided that his life was not worth living and took his own life. My friends, there are millions of people living in those kinds of lives should it not be our pleasure? Should it not drive us? Should it not be our passion to say to those people, my friend, you don't have to be afraid anymore. There is a God who wants you, who loves you, who wants to bring you home to live with him forever. Best news ever, right? Best news ever. And so remember the pictures, right? Remember the pictures. Here's God. He's saying, come on now, come on now. He's not driving us. He's not saying, oh, you bad person. You didn't come to church last week. You only watched me on TV last week. No, no, he's not doing that at all. That's the butcher. When you feel those, those feelings of guilt, my friends, when you feel those feelings of, of fear, I want you to know those are the tools of the devil. 
Jesus led us. Jesus leads, present tense. Jesus leads us all the way. That's the picture I want you to hold in your mind right now. He's leading his children. He's protecting them. He's bringing them out of Egypt. He's leading them like a little child who doesn't know how to walk, doesn't know where he's going, doesn't even know his footing, or like an older person who might have a neuropathy, who, like my father-in-law or like my mother, ended up not being able to feel his feet so he couldn't walk in the dark because he didn't know whether or not his next step would actually hit the ground. So he needed help. He needed a walker. Jesus says, just keep walking. Just, just come this way. I know you can't feel your feet anymore. I know you don't know where you're going. But just, just keep walking with me. I'll take care of you. I'll protect you. But they're walking around in the desert. And they, they look like, the Bible is telling us here, they look like they don't know where they're going. And God says to Moses, this is part of the plan. Because Pharaoh, you see, is going to say, they look like they're just wandering around in the desert. They don't know where they're going. And then he's going to wake up to the fact that two million of his people have just left his kingdom, and he is going to go after you, and I am going to be glorified, because even Egypt is now going to come to reverence me for what will happen next. So God leads them. He leads them into uh, the proverbial place of a rock and a hard place. You know, we say that phrase a lot. And some of us uh, haven't necessarily had that happen to us this week. But he leads them to, to pi, ha, it's a, probably a rough breathing mark in Hebrew, ha hirot, ha hirot, between Migdal and the sea. Positioning, you see, for this for this amazing event that God is going to take his people through is very important. I don't know if maybe you can look back over the last six months. I won't ask you to go any further back than that, but maybe you have to go back. Maybe you look back over the last six months and you say to yourself, you know, God has been leading me and he has been positioning me. I, I can tell you that story in my life. And here I stand, I know I stand here because of the grace of God. Because of the, the leading that God has in, in, in my life and in, and in Chris's life. He is, he is setting them up for the crossing. He's setting them up for the crossing. Pharaoh realizes what he's done. Uh, uh, and, and I'll just quickly go over this. Uh, how many of you are, are correctional officers and would know the the the... the phrase fled. Anyone? I think they did a movie about it. Uh, uh, some guys were fled. They con considered, I, I looked it up, it means fully licensed el eligibility date. Fled. I think it's the time just before release when we're trusting you to be ready to be released, but you're not quite released yet. Well, my Bible says the Israelites fled. I did check because I had remembered that Moses in his negotiations with Pharaoh had said, you know what, we need three days. Do you remember this part? It was, it was uh, early on in the plagues. We need three days to go and worship our God. <laughs> You know, when we need all our flocks and our herds, we need our women and children, we need everybody to go. Now, I don't know that Pharaoh was that dumb. He was pretty smart. He knew what, he knew what was going on. But by this time, when they have reached Migdal, they are gone. They are fled. They are out of his control, and he knows that he has to get them back, otherwise his kingdom is going down the tubes. So here we are in chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 9, tells us that the whole army, the whole army is called up. It's the big moment. This, this, is, now, this is now the big moment that God has been 
uh, directing everything very carefully, very compassionately, very kindly. He has been leading his people to this moment. This is why he did it. So we're going to ask our AV people to run a piece of a recent movie uh, called Exodus. Uh, it's, I, I consider it to be pretty biblically accurate, and um, it will help you to grab a hold of the idea that we're talking about this big moment right now. Thank God for subtitles. That's Moses and Aaron, by the way. He needs them to trust him. He's the mouthpiece of God. He needs them to trust him. Okay? This is what God has told him to do. And now they're between the mountains and the sea. So they've had a committee meeting and they've decided they're going. There's their tents and their everything, and they're getting ready to go. I mean, it's, ama it's amazing just to think of, of, of doing this movie, the people involved. But think of two million people, and Moses says it's time to go. Into the water. So here he goes. We're going to cross. All right? And we're going to jump forward a little bit. Okay? What's God going to do? Ah, but you see, Ramses is after his people too. And he looks down and he sees them. And he sees what's happening. I want you to smell the smell. The smell of the ocean. The smell of body sweat. <coughs> smell of animals, it's pungent, and they're going across, they're going across. Now what are they doing? They see, they see that the Egyptians are coming. So those with horses, those few are going to go to the rear, and they're going to help protect the people. Here they come. Here come the Egyptians. It's dry land. Remember, the chariot was like a tank in those days. So he had 600. He had 600 chariots. 600 chariots, yes. Very wealthy, very wealthy. And so here the few horsemen, here the few horsemen are going to do what they can, but God has already made dry land for the people to walk across. They are walking across, and here come the Egyptians onto the dry land. They see what's happening, but then in the distance now, you also see what is going to happen again. And here is, here is God. I don't know if you've ever been in a tornado. You ever been near a tornado? It is frightening. 
Here they go. They're, they're hurrying across. It's, it's dry. They can, they're getting across to the other side. Two million people. God, the Bible says, sent a, a great east wind and he piled up the sea. But now he's going to let it go. Now he's going to let it go. I think we all know what the word tsunami means. This was a tsunami in the Red Sea. And here it comes. Here it comes. His people are telling him, Ramses, turn back, turn back. Here comes, here comes the ocean. Here comes the ocean. And he says, go. Gets rid of his charioteer, who is, of course, useless to him because he's not doing what he wants. The Bible says that God sends confusion. He sends confusion upon the Israelites, uh, excuse me, upon the Egyptians. And watch this next. Watch what happens. Here you have some going forward, some, look at that. Is that not a picture of confusion? He sends them back. Now this is, I think this is Hollywood, by the way. Uh, I, don't know, I, I don't think Moses necessarily stayed in the midst of the sea, because that's what's going to happen. But I am going to say this. I do believe that this Egyptian leader and Moses were the two brothers that grew up together. And when he came back, he knew what he was coming back to. Moses did. And he was going to face the same guy that he had grown up with. So, yeah, this is Hollywood, but it is the one who has followed God and the one who is defying God. And now God is bringing back the water. Next time you're at the ocean, just remember how much you respect that three-foot wave. And he decides to stay there. That's the Hollywood part. The good news is, even in the movie, he survives, but he is washed up. He is washed up on sea. Look what happens. They see it coming. Get up the hill, get up the hill, get up the hill. And the water's the waters come back together. God says, stand still. Stand still and see that I will fight for you. I don't know where you are. Some of you I've talked to this week. Some of you I haven't. But I want you to know that the God of creation, I, 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 I don't know, uh, Pastor, I saw something here for the first time in my life. He parted the waters. Ten extra points for the person who can tell me on what day of creation did God part the waters. No, he made light on the first day. Second day. This is God signing off saying, I am the God of creation. I parted the waters before, I am going to part the waters again. It's, it's him. Suddenly I'm recognizing that this, this is his signature on the whole event. And then again throughout the Israelite history, you hear him harking back to this saying, I am the God who, may, who brought you out of Egypt. And I am the God who parted the waters. My question to you this morning is, have, have you heard from that God this week? 
Have you, have you been in this hard place? Have you needed God to fight for you? Have you needed him to, to be kind and considerate and just lead you along because your steps are shaky? Well, I have good news. The battle still ends the same way. The foes of Israel are vanquished. The Bible says not a single man went back from the Egyptian army. And it is, it's, it's a horrifying scene and, it, it, and it's terrible to think of the loss of life. And some people find that a mountain that's almost too hard to climb when they think about God and they think about his power and his majesty. And they, 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 they say, why? Why must it be this way? And I would ask you to ask those same questions because those people need to hear from you because he is, he is the great God of creation. And he wants to bring his people home. That's what Moses was saying. Did you see the script? Are you giving up on going to Canaan? Are you giving up? God has a, a whole country for you. He has a whole life for you. Don't give up. Trust him. This month, this month of May, we're going we're gonna to be looking at the idea of God being our protector. And we decided, uh, I had a quick conversation with Richard, that's what sparked this. And this month, we're going to be looking at God as, as protector. I wanted you to, to have this experience right at the very beginning. The neat thing is, at the end of the month, on Memorial Day, we're also going to deal with another parting of the waters. Okay? So if that is your desire, my friends, if that's what you would like to see happen in your life, we heard testimony. Remember we heard testimony this morning? God parted the waters for those lovely people who we sent a Bible to. Guess what? If you read your Bible and you let God speak in your life this week, he can part the waters for you too. I'm, I'm believing that and I'm, I'm going to claim that this week for myself and for my family. God bless you all and uh, may, may this God invade your life this week. Amen.